Welcome everyone to this semester's design conversations at the Jacobs Institute for Design Innovation at UC Berkeley. My name is Bjorn Hartman and I'm the faculty director for the Institute. I want to remind you that closed captioning is available for this event. You can turn that on in your interface. And I want to make you aware that this presentation is being recorded. Today, we're excited to welcome Leah Beachley from the University of New Mexico as a first speaker of the academic year. Before I introduce Leah, let me also tell you about the next two talks in the series because they are coming up soon. We will have Benjamin Earl Evans from Airbnb on October 2nd and Bryce Johnson from Microsoft on October 23rd. You can sign up for those talks on our website. Now I have a few housekeeping items. Uh, throughout the talk, we encourage you to ask questions using the Q&A function. And you can also use upvoting on others' questions. Feel free to add questions while you're listening to the talk and vote on them. We'll then go into a Q&A period after the talk where Eric Paulus and I will read your questions and have a discussion with our speaker. Now let me introduce Leah. Leah Beachley is a computer scientist whose work integrates electronics, computing, art, craft, and design. She received a PhD in computer science from the University of Colorado at Boulder and a BA in physics from Skidmore College. And she's also studied dance, theater, fine art, and design. She's currently an associate professor in the CS department at the University of New Mexico, where she directs the Hand and Machine Research Group, a group dedicated to exploring the connections between computer science, art, design, craft, and education. The goal of the Hand and Machine Research Group is to, di to diversify the entry point into computer science and technology by using a wide range of materials and using computers in unexpected contexts. Leah is dedicated to sharing the potential of computing with new audiences. She previously founded and directed the High Low Tech Research Group at MIT's Media Lab. Leah is well known as the inventor of the LilyPad Arduino, a construction kit for sewable electronics, and she's also pioneered advances in paper and fabric-based electronics. Leah's work has been featured in publications including the New York Times, the Boston Globe, and Wired, and has been exhibited in venues including Ars Electronica, the Exploratorium, and the Victoria and Albert Museum. Her work has also been recognized with the Edith Ackerman Award for Interaction Design in Children. Please join me in welcoming Leah Beachley. Uh, thank you so much, Bjorn, and uh, thank you all so much um, for, for coming today to uh, join the conversation. Okay, I'll go ahead and get started. Look at that. Oh, great. All right. So once again, uh, thanks Bjorn and Eric for having me here. It's really a delight. It's a pleasure. Uh, it's an honor. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you um, about the new research groups that I'm kind of building at the University of New Mexico. Um, I'm also going to kind of look back over some of the work that I've done over the course of my career and reflect on kind of the prompt um, that this kind of design conversation is oriented around. Um, so let me um, go ahead and get started. Before I kind of dive into my talk, um, I just wanted to, I don't know, um, acknowledge and kind of take a moment to, um, to uh, just say hi to my former advisor, Mike Eisenberg, who passed away this year, who's really a brilliant and extraordinary person. And if you're not familiar with his work, um, I'd encourage you to check, out, check it out. Um, anyway, he was so great and had such a wonderful influence on me. Um, so check out his work if you don't know it. Um, okay, so the topic of this series of conversations at the Jacobs Institute is um, for whom, by whom, kind of designed for belonging. I want 
wanted to start, I've been, you know, thinking about that topic. That topic in many ways has been a big feature of my work and my career. Um, but it's, this is a nice opportunity to reflect on it. Um, I wanted to start just by saying bluntly that I'm very interested about thinking about culture and technology, kind of the relationships between culture and technology, which are very complex um, and rich, um, sometimes problematic, uh, uh, sometimes you know, fantastic and wonderful. Oftentimes when we think about the way that technology connects with culture and perhaps especially today, we think about things from a very particular perspective. So first of all, we tend to think about technology in a fairly constrained way as like computers and electronics, like software and stuff. That's like, we use the word technology as a shorthand for those things. And typically the people who uh, are have the most to say, it seems, about technology and culture are um, not necessarily technology developers. They are perhaps anthropologists or sociologists or journalists, perhaps. Um, I think historically in the technology field, we'll accept that shorthand, um, technology designers have thought too little about culture, but they've thought too little about culture in a, in a, in a particular way, I think, that we'll get to. So I'm gonna talk today um, about thinking, trying to think deeply about culture and technology um, as a technology designer and how those things connect and are related to each other, but in really rich, fruitful, interesting ways that are maybe not the ways that we're used to thinking about. Um, okay, so with that preamble, um, let's go ahead and get started. Oftentimes, my entry point in thinking about technology design and culture is to think about kind of technology in a broad sense as like the tools people make kind of in some even very broad sense we can think about technology as like the the things that people build right just like stuff that people build we can think of that as technology and so i am very interested in taking that broad perspective and then thinking about the materials that people use to build stuff with and the traditions of making that are rooted in different cultures kind of from around the world or around the country. Um, and how those things, materials and making traditions, um, are deeply related to like who, um, who makes stuff and how we think of the stuff that is made. Kind of wrapping that back to like our um, present day definition of technology is like kind of computers and electronics, kind of trying to connect rich materials and long-standing kind of making practices to technology. Okay, so a lot of theoretical discussion. Let's dive into some, some concrete examples. So first, um, really, I began, you know, my career in computer science to some extent with, um, with an exploration of textiles and thinking about how textiles might be relatable to electronics and computation. Um, and kind of the way I started is I stumbled upon these like magical, beautiful materials. In particular, I stumbled on the fact that there were like threads and fabrics that were made with metal um, and that you could use them to build electronics. Like if, if, you, if there were threads that were conductive and if there were fabrics that were conductive, you could use them to build electronics. And that just seemed kind of marvelous and delightful for so many reasons, um, largely kind of cultural reasons, right? So I just started, started to like play around with, with these materials. And on the one hand, you have these textile materials. And on the other hand, you have these traditional kind of technology materials um, that are really not designed to be mashed up with textiles, but there's a lovely kind of engineering challenge here. So I started to play around with different ways to kind of connect electronics and textiles. Um, this is an example of like an early project. This is a wearable display with lots of stitched in LEDs. 
Um, this is another one, a wearable display. This is actually a beaded bracelet that's made on a bead loom. Um, this is a more practical um, early design that I made. This is a jacket that I made for getting around town on my bike that has uh, turn signals kind of stitched into it. Um, in conjunction with these kind of designing actual artifacts, I was really interested in designing actual kind of new integrations of textiles and electronics kind of ways at a somewhat like uh, next level how these things could fit together and how other people could have access to the same creative medium that I was exploring. So here's I developed a method for making circuit boards on textiles. I started to make little um, kits of electronic textile pieces that potentially other people could use in projects. This is an example of a little microcontroller kind of mounted to a textile circuit board. And the idea is that, you know, you could hand this micro microcontroller to somebody with a spool of conductive thread, and then they could stitch it um, into textiles to make their own designs. This then morphed into a uh, commercial uh, 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 design effort where um, I translated the textile-based design into a traditional circuit board and collaborated with SparkFun Electronics to make um, the first versions of the Lilypad Arduino kit. Um, and uh, a marvelous thing happened. So people started to kind of actually get the kit and make stuff with it. Um, the fact that there was now a commercial kit available um, made doing kind of outreach and engagement with other people much more feasible for me. And so I was able to teach workshops. For example, these are two young women who attended um, one of my workshops and kind of use this as a platform for getting kids and others like engaged in computation and electronics, but through this very different set of materials and through, the, through this very different set of cultural practices, kind of cultural making traditions. Once the kit had been out in the world for a while, it was possible to kind of assess to some extent some of those relationships between culture and technology, and particular to begin to assess in a very concrete way, like who was using this technology, kind of who was adopting it. And in the case of the lily pad Arduino, there was a very natural contrast, right? The Arduino is a longstanding kind of popular um, hardware platform. And I just developed like a, a version of the Arduino that was for a different set of materials. So it was very easy to contrast the projects and people who were working with the traditional Arduino to the projects and people who are working with the lily pad Arduino. And so this snapshot shows you um, gives you a visual sense of that contrast. Yes. Sorry, that's my six year old. So we could contrast these two communities. And one of the most striking things that we were able to document was the fact that, um, as you might suspect, um, women were adopting and using the lily pad. Um, much more than they had like traditional Arduino hardware platforms. Um, so it seemed that the lily pad really was having a substantial impact on culture, on who was building with, um, with hardware, simply by kind of shifting the material domain that we were working in. So of course, the lily pad Arduino is like functionally identical to the traditional Arduino, but you're just working with a different set of materials, kind of it's put in a different cultural context. Um, so that is a, an overview of kind of my work with textiles. And I think like the most important um, takeaways uh, in terms of its relationship to culture. I wanted to shift and talk a little bit about previous work that I've done in paper-based electronics and um, kind of paint-based electronics. Um, let's see. So here is uh, uh, this project also began um, with 
for me, the discovery of like another set of like delightful, fascinating materials, in particular, conductive inks and paints that let you draw or paint um, with uh, electronics in the same way that conductive threads and, and um, conductive fra fabrics let you embed kind of electronics into textiles. Conductive paints and inks let you embed electronics into paper and importantly, kind of anything else you could paint. Um, so that's where this project started for me, like the material of paper and paint and all of those rich kind of making traditions associated with those materials. Um, it was around this time that I had the great fortune to like begin working at the MIT Media Lab and kind of starting out with a group of really wonderful students. So um, my students and I got to explore this medium together. Um, and I was also incredibly lucky to have as one of my first students at the Media Lab, um, G. Chi, who came in with an incredibly rich background in working with paper already. And she was able to do so many gorgeous and wonderful things. I want to play a short snippet of this video that is some of um, G's and my like early explorations of just like fun kind of technical stuff you could do with paper and electronics. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop that. Um, I love that work, but I want to get on to some newer projects. Um, that gives you a sense of, you know, some of the fun we had playing with just what the medium of paper um, was, you know, what was possible when you combined electronics and computation with the paper medium. We also worked on another series of projects around kind of painting large scale surfaces with um, conductive and other paints um, to create very large scale kind of interactive surfaces. Um, this was a series of that we called kind of interactive wallpaper. So you can see this is a, a snapshot of one of those pieces. Um, and I'll come back to this later. Um, G also um, went on to do all sorts of amazing work. This is a beautiful interactive pop-up book that she made. I won't show a video, but you can find one online. Um, she also made a series of really gorgeous, like interactive kind of paintings um, using paper-based electronics. And ultimately the work that she did and the rest of our team at MIT and, um, and I did kind of that, that collective work evolved into a toolkit that was similar in spirit to the lily pad Arduino, kind of a, a toolkit for working with paper-based electronics. Um, so G really led this project and kind of started a startup company with um, Bunny Huang called um, uh, Chibitronics. Here I'll, um, before I get to that company, I'll show some quick prototypes that kind of were the pre precursors of the commercial kit that um, G developed. These are, um, yep, these uh, are kind of a kit for making uh, paper-based circuits with conductive paint and LEDs and batteries and a little microcontroller. This is some kids kind of coming to workshops um, that we hosted in our lab and some of the constructions that they made. There's some other kids coming to workshops that G taught 
um, working with paper-based electronics. Um, and then finally, this is the kit called Circuit Stickers that GE developed. So I'll go ahead and play a little bit of this video. a sense of the Chibitronics kit um, that, as you can see, allows you to very quickly and easily kind of work with paper-based electronics to embed um, electronics into paper constructions. Um, once this kit was out in the world and available as a product, it again positioned us to be able to assess like who is using this product, product like what are they making with it? Um, you know, what is happening? What is kind of the cultural impact of this, um, this new piece of technology? So what you see on the screen now um, is just a collection of some of the projects that different people made um, using the Chibitronics like uh, uh, circuit stickers kit. Um, you see a whole range of, of lovely projects, some, most of them paper-based, but not all of them. There are um, many kind of interesting and creative uses as well. We could then con conduct analyses that were similar to the analyses that we conducted in the Lilypad Arduino st uh, study. And here's what we found kind of looking at who um, purchasers were over the course of two years right after the, the kit first came out. This was actually quite surprising to us. So in some sense, we expected to see a, a big gender divide in users with the lily pad because textiles are so like such a gendered kind of material in our society, but that seems much less true of paper. Um, so it was startling to us that a majority, like a, a very overwhelming majority of uh, Chibitronics customers were women. Um, it turns out in this, caught us by a surprise, it turned out that there developed around Chibitronics a whole kind of fascinating subculture of people who do scrapbooking. And so um, a ton of scrapbookers began incorporating electronics and interactivity into their elaborate, kind of the elaborate note cards and scrapbooking projects that they did. So we were <laughs> drawing in this whole new and very unexpected kind of community of people into working with um, like computation and electronics. So that was kind of really interesting and unexpected um, and kind of lovely. Um, again, I think the results here underscore the power of putting like technology into different material and cultural contexts. Um, okay, so that's a review of like some of the previous work that I've done. I now wanted to talk about some of the projects that I'm working on right now that are kind of just getting started that I'm really excited about. Um, so the first is a project around interactive murals. Um, so this builds off of the projects um, that my students and I started, um, my former students and I started back at MIT, um, this uh, series of interactive wallpapers. The interactive mural project 
what we're going to do is we're going to take this basic idea of very large scale surfaces with embedded electronics that allow for kind of large scale full body interaction and scale that up <laughs> even bigger um, and embed this kind of functionality into murals. So large scale outdoor murals. Um, we have the tremendous fortune of working with, um, collaborating with a spectacular um, kind of New Mexican, native New Mexican mural artist, Nani Chacon. Um, she, I'll just share a bit of her work with you. Um, she is a Navajo slash Hispanic artist and much of her work uh, revolves around kind of uh, celebrating that history and that culture. It's very kind of rooted in New Mexico and rooted in her own identity. Um, so just some of her beautiful murals. Um, we're also collaborating with a um, organization here in Albuquerque working classroom that kind of brings students from um, from kind of poor and uh, underprivileged backgrounds and teaches them how to paint murals and engages them in large scale mural projects around um, New Mexico and particularly around the city of Albuquerque. And in fact, Nani, although these things came together um, un somewhat unexpectedly, Nani is one of the artists that collaborates often with working classroom. And so she will often paint these very large scale murals by collaborating with young people and having them paint um, chunks of the, the mural and teaching them both about kind of how to paint a mural, but also about like history and art and kind of the politics of this area and so on. So here's snapshots of Nani on the left, working with a team of middle school, school students to paint um, this enormous mural um, at their school. And you can see the community coming out to like, uh, enjoy um, the unveiling of the mural here on the right. Um, this is a snapshot also of working classroom. They have a physical space where students can like take classes, like um, kind of have their initial learning experiences before they go out into the field to paint murals. Here again is another beautiful snapshot of kids kind of out on location painting a mural. Um, so what we're trying to do is combine this like beautiful practice that um, Nani has developed and working classroom has developed and kind of mash it up with some of the technology um, that we have developed in working with um, electronics and conductive paints um, and, um, and so on and so forth. So we're gonna try to combine these things. This project is just starting, um, but there's all sorts of really interesting um, all sorts of really interesting components of it. It's a very large scale project. So the first thing that we're working on is um, there are material challenges. So it was one thing to build these very large scale surfaces and install them like in a home. Uh, it's quite another to have functioning electronics that are installed outside for extended periods of time. So we're in the midst of creating these um, swatches of different materials. Um, to test whether they can withstand these conditions and there are all sorts of variables to test um, as you can imagine, but we're um, kind of there's this hardcore kind of technical component of the project. Um, there's also a big kind of hardware and software challenge. So we need to figure out like an, a functioning architecture for the murals themselves um, and they have to function and they also some component of the murals has to be um, accessible to the middle school students or the young people that we're going to engage in this activity. So we're using like the circuit playground express um, and then networking a bunch of those um, kind of collecting data about what is happening on the mural, how people people are interacting with it and then sending that interaction data to a web server. Um, and then finally using that to run a front end website that you can use, that people can use to visualize and see um, what is happening on the mural. Um, and not only what might be happening at that moment, but it should give you a way to kind of play back the history of interactions that have happened on a mural. So this is just, um, I should say, this is a, 
all of the back end and front end so far has been built by an awesome student here that I'm, that I'm working with, um, DM Raisel Asan. Um, this is a mock-up that we put together just demoing the front end of the website. So you should be able to kind of see what is happening and the different behaviors that are triggered on the mural and be, be able to like play that and rewind it and, and kind of browse through the history of the mural. The mural will also function as like a weather station. So each mural will collect kind of ongoing information about the environment that it's embedded, embedded in, including air quality um, measures and so on. And so that historical information will also be on the website. Um, this is also in many ways, perhaps most interestingly, a really, um, exciting co-design challenge. So um, Nani and I, along with my students and the students from Working Classroom, are going to um, have to figure out how to put all of these pieces together. So how to kind of teach the um, students kind of the artistic practice that they're going to need to learn to participate in these projects, but also to use this experience as a way to teach them about computation and electronics enough that they will be able to design and then build that component of the project as well. Um, and so we're just, we've kind of built um, our back end. We're getting kind of firm and we're just about to start collaborating with, with um, Nani and then later on some students. So, um, so lots of, of stuff to do. We're just getting started, but I'm so excited about this project. So um, stay tuned for that one. I'm going to talk about one other project really quickly, and then we'll stop so we can actually have a discussion. Um, the other project that we are starting to work on that I'm um, really thrilled about as well um, is a project that is exploring kind of materials and technology from a slightly different perspective. Instead of embedding computation into physical objects, um, we're using computation to generate physical objects. So, um, and more specifically, um, we're working in the realm of ceramics and using um, essentially code or algorithms to generate um, patterns or forms for ceramics and then using a combination of kind of building by hand and building by machine to create finished objects. So here's an example of a little workflow for a project um, that I did or a piece that I designed. So I write a program that generates this pattern for a plate. I then can etch that pattern into a piece of clay with a laser cutter. So there's this is the computational design part. This is the fabrication part. And then the finished object is like built through a combination of these like kind of technology driven methods and kind of the traditional craft of handmade ceramics. So we're exploring kind of this field quite broadly. Um, one of the things that I've been doing over the past like couple of years is just first of all, learning how to build ceramics and then developing a suite of techniques um, for kind of blending computational design, fabrication, and tra uh, traditional ceramics craft. So here you see a photograph of the process of kind of laser etching a piece of clay and then kind of making that etched pattern really stand out clearly um, using traditional ceramic techniques. Um, and this, again, is a computationally generated pattern that you see on the plate. Um, I've been working with um, a wonderful student, Melody Horn, um, to just start to develop some kind of small scale, like software sketches of like things that we could develop, like um, software for parametric ceramics design that are really oriented around what people traditionally do with ceramics. So a popular way to construct ceramics is to kind of roll out a flat sheet of of clay and then cut out the pattern that you'd like and kind of fold it up into a clay piece like like origami or something. Now in traditional ceramics world, the way you get these patterns that you cut out and make um, ceramic pieces out of is like people share specific 
patterns on places like Pinterest. And this is a domain or it's just kind of crying out for a, a computational solution. So this is a, a piece of software that lets you easily um, design kind of computationally design kind of prismatic and, and conical shapes and then print out the patterns you'd need to construct those pieces in clay. Here's some uh, snapshot of just some of the finished cake, clay pieces that were made with that software. Um, the next steps in our work with ceramic is to kind of connect our little kind of technical sketches that we've already done to, um, to culture in a much deeper way. Um, and so we are collaborating with an amazing um, collection of ceramic artists here in New Mexico um, to co-design um, with them through kind of studio residencies here in my lab, um, new computational design uh, software and new uh, computational fabrication kind of techniques and potentially machines. So here are a couple of the artists we're working with. They're just amazing. Um, so this is Shell Niemark who makes tiles. This is um, Brandon Ortiz who um, is a, a, a member of Taos Pueblo who makes uh, these gorgeous micaceous um, pottery following the you know, long standing traditional methods. Everything is done by hand, including the firing, which happens like in a literal fire pit. Um, uh, a couple of very contemporary artists. This is uh, Daniel Gaver on the left. And you can see, by the way, this is a slab um, built piece. Um, and the La Donna Victoriano, who is a member of um, Acoma Pueblo, and they have an amazing, amazingly rich ceramics tradition that um, I'm really excited to work with La Donna and um, hopefully others in that um, tradition. So trying to connect what we know technology can do with longstanding um, ceramic practices um, and particularly ceramic practices that are really rooted to this place um, and the communities and people who are here um, in New Mexico. So stay tuned for that project too. Um, so stepping back, and I better stop soon, sorry. Um, thinking about these relationships between culture and technology as a technology designer, I feel like, like culture is so incredibly rich, right? It's the stuff of our lives. It's all of that stuff. It's like communities and knowledge. It's about place. It's about history and language. Of course, about art, but also about economies. Also, of course, about technology, right? Technology kind of grows out of culture and is a part of culture. It's also so much about kind of materials and forms. It's about colors and sounds and tastes, right? These kind of sensual, sensual, like material, materially rooted things. And so we can, what I want to say as a technology designer is that we can think about culture and like the relationships between technology and culture at the beginning of our projects instead of at the end. So what commonly happens when we think about um, technology design is people design a piece of software or design a piece of hardware and kind of, you know, make it. And then as an after afterthought, maybe be like, well, how do we engage like diverse people in this thing that I made? Or how do we um, kind of, uh, you know, draw people in? Or how do we fix maybe the impact that this is having on, on culture that we didn't anticipate and turns out is really negative? We tend to, as technologists, or there's a tradition in technology design, I think, of not thinking much about culture in the beginning and thinking about at the end. And oftentimes when you think about it at the end, it's also like a dreary chore, right? You're like, I made this amazing, wonderful thing. And like the cultural part is frustrating and it's not working out the way I intended. So it's like this, I don't know, HR type of chore that you have to worry about culture. You have to worry about like the fact that maybe diverse people aren't using your thing, or you have to worry about like there are these negative unintended consequences when you didn't have like any ill intent when you designed that piece of technology, right? I want to say that there is amazing power and richness for 
us as technology designers, if we can think about and draw from culture at the beginning, it isn't a dreary, like afterthought chore thing that you have to do. It isn't like an HR thing. It's a gorgeous, fantastic, creative thing. The richness of culture that we can draw from, like all of those different experiences, all of that different expertise, all of those different materials, like when we draw inspiration from those to develop new technologies, that's an enormous, like untapped arena to, um, for technology innovation, to leverage those resources. And we can approach it with delight and joy and curiosity um, instead of, um, you know, oh, we have to like make sure that everybody can use this and we better or we're not, you know, good people or whatever. It, it's not a, it shouldn't be, a, or it doesn't have to be thought about or motivated, even politically, it can be thought about and motiva motivated in a really joyous, open kind of creative way. So that's what the main takeaway um, that I wanted to communicate to you is like culture as being an incredibly rich source of inspiration and creativity that we can all tap into. And it's kind of astonishing to me that we don't do a better job of that now. Um, okay. So um, thank you so much for listening and sorry that I talked for a bit longer than I think I should have. And I've been ignoring your questions. I'm sorry, I'll go back over to them now. So thank you, Leah, for that great talk. Um, we now have time for Q&A and Eric and I can moderate that so you're not overwhelmed with a number of different questions. Um, I want to encourage everyone of our attendees to take a look at these questions and upvote those questions you think are um, uh, especially interesting to you so we can ask them live. And then we may not get to all of the questions and I um, want to point out that for the next 24 hours, if you're a UC student or affiliate, we'll also continue this conversation on Slack. And uh, Lauren Artis can post the URL for that into the chat. So let me get started our, with one question, then I'll turn it over to Eric to ask uh, another question. So uh, Lena Morita asks, um, she works in accessibility for students with disabilities. Have you used art and technology in helping that population? Yeah, I have not. Um, so that is not a, a population that I have worked closely with. I can say that I know um, some wonderful um, colleagues who have used, you know, similar tools um, in those contexts, but that has not been my area of specialty. I think there are tremendous opportunities there. Um, in particular, um, in valuing the, the diversity and richness of our different senses, right? And, and leveraging all of those to um, approach kind of designing and thinking about technology. But, um, but I, I don't have that, that particular expertise. Thanks, Leah. Eric, you wanna ask great. the next question? Yeah, sure. Um, first, great questions by everyone too. And thank you, Leah, for a great talk. Um, Particularly, some of the questions are playing into the, the theme, the whole, uh, you know, for whom, by whom. And another one is, uh, Jaron Treadway is asking, uh, do you feel that making computational work more fun, playful, and accessible will significantly change the development of future technologies due to involving people that might not otherwise be involved in computational work? So kind of how can that change? Yeah, I think that there is wonderful potential there. I think um, our, my own experiences with my, some of the previous projects I've worked on have, um, have really encouraging results. Um, in particular, well, um, we've done a number of interviews with people who've worked in textiles and there is, you know, 
we've met a number of people who are like, I was really intimidated by electronics and, and computers. But then, you know, when it was presented in this context that I felt I had mastery over, I was like, I can totally do this. So the sense of like agency um, uh, can really change depending on the um, material context that you're working in. Um, also some of like Kylie Pepler's wonderful work touches on this also. So I think there is really good evidence that yes, that can happen. Um, and G's work with paper-based electronics has also been really transformative, I think. In particular, I won't talk forever, but um, her work, like now, like everywhere you go, you see people making copper tape circuits on paper and like, like G did that. And that's so cool and lovely and exciting. I think a lot of, a lot more people are learning about electronics in this lightweight, fun and expressive way um, because of some of this, this work. So, I think there's lots of potential there. Great, thanks. All right. Um, next question comes from an anonymous attendee. I'm very intrigued about the combination of new fabrication techniques with ancestral practices, for example, clay work. I know that for some indigenous peoples, this might be a very sensitive issue. I'm wondering how the partnership with indigenous artists originated and how you deal with these kinds of cultural sensitive issues. Yeah, no, it's, um, I, this is a project that we're really just starting and I so appreciate the, the complexity of the issues here. Um, we are working, so um, I should say that we're working very closely with members of um, the communities that um, we're um, collaborating with. One of our, um, co-PIs on the pro on that particular project is also kind of lives on the reservation is native himself and is you know really impressive me and others on those exact topics so one one conversation for example that we've had and it's really interesting and has no good answers is like who cares about like like fancy new computational design technology right like right now right now like native artists lives are tanking because they have no outlet for their craft work like that market has kind of completely dried up like they just need money to like survive um and particularly at this current time so like what the heck are we doing like thinking about this fancy new technology like who cares we should be actually supporting native people and giving them what they really need right now which is not like a fancy 3d printer so yeah um, and there are obvious issues around reproduction and appropriation, and um, but we are treading very delicately and just um, having lots of conversations about it, and um, yeah, trying to work at, as you know, complete equal partners and with sensitivity and care. Then, but it's very interesting and fraught. Thank you. Yeah, so I think another question uh, that also relates to in some of the indigenous practices and cultures, which uh, maybe you can expand on as well, but uh, there's a question also about maker spaces and inclusivity that uh, Arkadeep Kumar asks. Um, Thanks, Dr. Beakley, for an exciting talk. How do you think your research and products can make maker spaces and making more equal, more accessible in resource constrained settings? So without the need for high cost of machines, since I'm uh, asking, I'm asking since to try and encourage making in rural and resource constrained schools. I think you have a lot of expertise in understanding that. Um, and also of the bottlenecks, uh, the cost of the instruments, the materials. And he also asked a separate question um, related to culture. Can we leverage making practices of indigenous cultures who use traditional methods and still created over centuries, possibly not needing costly machines such as ceramics that you showed. And I think you already addressed this a little bit, but I invite you to, um, if you want to expand on that, but uh, certainly the maker spaces and some of the costs of materials and machines. Yeah, I, um, I, gosh, so many things to say here. One of the things that I think has been such a, uh, uh, an unfortunate, way that we have come to think of maker spaces is a space full of fancy equipment as opposed to like a community of people um, who are like sharing like their making practices i think um so so 
rethinking like what is important for like a maker safe space to be a maker space as part of that. I want to also say that like the power of computation, uh, you, there are lots of ways to leverage that without very expensive machines. So, I mean, just as a small example, you're like, your inkjet printer is a tremendously rich and powerful way to do computational design. Like on it, I can do kind of fabric, right? You can print on fabric. You can do like all sorts of lovely things. You can print like tattoo paper and give yourself tattoos. You can print out templates like the clay example shows that then enable you to work in other media. Um, so just a, a regular off the shelf printer is incredibly powerful. Then lots of really cheap machines are out there that are incredibly powerful. So in particular, craft cutters do, um, are both like a 2D plotter um, and a 2D cutter and you know replace a laser cutter essentially. They're quite powerful fabrication machines. You can get one for about 200 bucks. And then finally, I'll say that you can get a decent 3D printer now for like 250 bucks. So there are lots of things that are accessible at many different levels. And I think the most important things are kind of the people who are there maybe the materials that are at hand and that there's a diversity of materials, um, but lots to do. Uh, yeah. I hope that's helpful. No, very encouraging. Thank you. Right. Next is a question from Franklin. Uh, it's kind of a technical question. So you showed us paper and fabric based um, electronics. Now printed circuit boards are notoriously bad for the environment. And simplifying boards can come at the cost of sacrificing features or making more external compromises. And also difficult to reclaim materials that are in integrated into printed circuit boards. Might there be or has there been an opportunity to use textile based boards from a sustainability perspective? Yeah, um, I think that, okay, a couple of thoughts. I mean, one, I want to be frank and I, um, I think like embedding electronics into things is like a horrible for the environment. It's just like horrible. And, and I have questions about, you know, from a sustainability perspective, like we probably shouldn't be doing this at all. And, and I, um, so that's like one comment and I just want to ignore, acknowledge that it's horrible. I, I sometimes, anyway, I get, I can get, it's, frustrating when the, the arguments made for sustainability can often be quite shallow. And I don't want to make a shallow argument. Um, I think making a circuit board on a piece of on textile or paper is, on the one hand, kind of naturally more sustainable than getting a PCB made. On the other hand, it's worse in the sense that what we're doing is encouraging like more people to play with this technology, more people to like embed electronics into things like paper and textiles that never had them before. So I don't, um, I think it's a topic that warrants um, much more thought, including on, on, on my part. Um, I want to, I don't know, for the most part, like just very um, bluntly acknowledge the problems here. Um, yeah. Great. So I'm going to, um, there's a question, there's a couple questions on a theme and I kind of want to try to capture them. Um, uh, one of them is by Mark Olberg. Good to see you again. One of our original Invention Lab uh, folks. So it feels like the home crew. Um, he's asking, uh, he might recall, um, you gave a talk here previously, uh, learning versus education, and you weighed the dilemmas you faced in deciding where to, you know, send your own kid to school. And you're, she's sort of a personally wondering what you decided. But I want to connect that to another um, question from Lena uh, about what influences have the mural projects that you've maybe seen with middle school students? Are, is it causing them to get more interested in the art side or the technology side or both? And uh, it's a great way to reach out to students who otherwise might not have thought of these as career paths, either technology or working with circuits. So where do you see the role of education in sort of influencing this work and also how you influence education directly? Yeah, thanks. Um, so the uh, first, a quick answer to the like education thing. Um, you know, we chose like a, a 
kind of middle path, but it very much solidly within the like yuppie parent paradigm, which felt like I couldn't not do it, which is um, my son is now attending like a charter school. Um, and uh, so it's, you know, technically a public school in some sense. The worst thing about it, and I think I talked about this in my talk, is that um, to get into this charter school, they have a pay daycare option. So many of the slots for the school, the way that students get admitted to the charter school is that they pay to have their kid enrolled in um, pre-K there, and then that slides over into being admitted into the school. And that's what I did, and I feel crappy about it, um, but yeah. So, okay, that's that question. Um, on the uh, other um, educational side, I, I didn't talk so much about this in my talk, but in the same way that I think it's really worthwhile to integrate um, culture and technology development, like really early on, I think it's quite valuable to integrate, um, you know, kids learning experiences with really authentic technology research. Um, and that's been, so really engage them in the development in many ways of like cutting edge technology. And that's a legitimate and not unfeasible thing to do. And it's a quite delightful thing to do. Um, I think that, um, that these, you know, the weird new technologies that I'm interested in de developing, in part, I'm interested in developing them to, you know, make new kind of technology subcultures and to create new opportunities for people to like live a life as a technology designer, right? And so working with children and as that process kind of happens is a way both for me to understand whether or not the medium is likely to be successful. And also, I hope for them, a way for them to experience, you know, the possibilities of technology, the possibility that it could be something that maybe they don't think it, it, it normally is, the possibilities that they could play a real role in developing new technologies. Um, I think all of integrating all of those experiences for kids can be really powerful. Um, and again, like really beneficial and useful um, to me as a designer. Um, yeah, so I, I hope that answers that question. All right, next, uh, I'm gonna try to bring together three separate questions that were asked that all have to do with uh, the data on demographics that you share. So uh, first question from an anonymous attendee came, um, was the cultural aspect of LilyPad and Chibitronics always important from the very beginning? What prompted you to learn about the demographics? So first mention of demographics. Then there was a question, have you observed any such striking cultural impl implications, demographic implications of your work with ceramics? And then the last part is um, about the, the, it was, interesting to see um, the scrapbooking uptake for Chibitronics and if you've looked at age and if you were maybe surprised at um, age demographics. Okay, yeah, let's, let's see. So um, to start at the beginning, like is the kind of cultural stuff and of interest from the start? Yes. Um, I mean, a lot of what makes, I think, the cultural stuff fun to do is like, is the almost submers sub subversiveness of it, right? These unexpected pairings of like different subcultures, for lack of a better word, right? The textile subculture and the techie, like um, embedded hardware subculture, right? So that is, in fact, in many ways, the essence one of the key appeals to this kind of work is, is those unexpected combinations and juxtapositions. So always that is a big part of the appeal. I have to say though that all of that stuff is jumbled up together. So the cultural stuff is jumbled up with the material stuff and the material itself has all of these complex cultural associations, right? Um, 
And so materials, kind of people, um, kind of tradition tends to be interconnected in all sorts of interesting ways. And so all of that is a lot of what underlies the, you know, initial int interests in any particular domain. Um, so in terms of the demographics, um, let's see, we haven't yet, so I, I haven't done enough work. We both the ceramics project and the mural project are kind of just starting. So we haven't yet gotten to a point where we can do any meaningful assessment of like demographics of like who might be interested in this stuff. Um, we, we don't know yet. Um, the other question you asked about age, we've done a little bit of research around age. So particularly with um, the textile work, um, we did a fair amount of work, um, or I should say a little bit of work with um, using that as a way to engage like, you know, older adults in, in computing. Um, many older adults have amazing expertise in one of these craft domains. And so we, we did explore that some with the textiles and found that it was, you know, as to be expected, like a good way to engage older people in, you know, feeling comfortable with and interested in technology and working with technology in a creative way. We didn't look closely at the age of the scrapbooking people. I don't know, I'll mention it, mention it to G and suggest maybe we do a follow-up analysis or something. But I, your intuition, I suspect, is right that it's likely to be a lot of older women, perhaps, or you know, middle-aged and older women who might be doing that. Although, I don't know, I could be wrong, but um, I think that would be really interesting to do. Um, yeah. All right. Um. We are coming to the end of our time here. So um, maybe we'll stop the live Q&A right here. Um, I would just like to thank Leah again for spending her time with us. And I'd also like to thank all of you for attending and for the many excellent questions that you sent in. There were many great questions that we didn't have the time to get to. So I just wanna remind everyone that we will have a 24 hour ongoing Slack conversation with our speaker after the event that is limited to UC Berkeley students and um, affiliates. So um, the link for that we've posted in the chat. Maybe Lauren, you can post it one last time. And then I also want to make you aware of the Design Conversations website um, where you can register for future events. And we will also post a recording of this conversation as soon as we can. So thank you again, Leah. Um, thanks to everyone. Uh, that was really interesting. It was the first time we ran this experiment of the online Q and A, and it was really, um, it was really great to see so much uh, interest and engagement for everyone. So thank you, and we will see you at the next design conversation. <laughs>